So ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for being here so early, and it's, it's really an honor and a privilege um, to deliver this lecture on the history, the present, and the future of target controlled infusion. And um, I feel very humble because some of you here in the audience are the giants in TCI and um, played an enormous role in the development of target controlled infusion, uh, or at least the models that are um, incorporated in these, in these models. And for me, it's like not only a home match, but um, certainly I'm, um, the people in the room here are in some parts more and bigger experts than myself. So please, this is a history lecture. So guys, if you feel that I misquoted you, interrupt me and tell the truth, because some things are a little bit older. Anyway. I bring you greetings from Groningen, and I always have to explain where Groningen is. Groningen is in the north part of the Netherlands. It's the most northern city in the Netherlands, above us only the sea. So um, there is a saying in Groningen, nothing goes above Groningen, and that's, that's true, because otherwise you end in the North Sea. We have canals, we have a fantastic museum, and we have a university that celebrated last year the 400th anniversary. This is our hospital, 11,000 employee hospital, and the only uh, level four uh, university medical center in the north of Netherlands. So greetings from Groningen. I have some conflicts of interest to share with you, as you can see here, and it's also in the program. And we will talk about target controlled infusion. I assume that I don't have to explain the expert audience you all are that when giving intravenous drugs in anesthesia as a bolus or as a continuous infusion without a bolus, that it's not the best job we can do. You all know that when you inject, and I did some simulations here with a bolus of two milligram per kilogram, very fastly given propofol bolus, that if you inject that two milligram per kilogram very fastly, the blue lines are the predicted plasma concentrations, the red lines are the predicted effect site concentration using the Schneider model, and you see that you have an overshoot here. And that overshoot of that bolus might lead to some side effects. You can say, I don't want to give boluses, I only will work with continuous infusions, but even with drugs that are considered fast acting like propofol, it takes an awful amount of time to reach a clinical relevant concentration, for example, around four micrograms per milliliter. This is how most of us here in the room were trained in their residency to become an anesthesiologist. And we combine boluses and continuous infusion. But most of the intravenous drugs we are given, most of our anesthetics are accumulating after a while, so you have to decrease the infusion rate after a certain moments of time. This is what we commonly do in clinical practice, we start with the bolus still producing an overshoot and then you have to step down in your infusion scheme uh, to avoid accumulation of the drug. So wouldn't it be nice if instead of having to titrate by changing the infusion rates manually to reach and maintain a plasma or even better effect site concentration, if it would be possible to avoid that uncontrolled overshoot in the beginning by using pharmacokinetic modeling, by using computer technology. Wouldn't it be nice to have target controlled infusion to reach a specific targeted concentration and let the computer, let the pump do the job? This is how it all started, plasma controlled TCI. I will tell you that in the meantime, we learned much more about the effect sites the place where really the drug effect is, and we all know that the plasma for most of our drugs or the <coughs> blood compartment is not the site of drug effect, it's outside, and it's uh, called the effect site or the biophase, and wouldn't it be even more optimal to titrate towards a specific effect site concentration? Therefore, you need an overshoot at the plasma level to fasten up the equilibration, but that bolus is much better controlled than the, than the uncontrolled bolus you give here. So this is where, for the last 40 years, people worked on. It all started a long time ago. It started 
with uh, in the 50s, I will tell you uh, how it started, but this is what became known as target controlled infusion. So for those who are not familiar with TCI, it's a computer assisted drug infusion. The aim is, as I told you, to achieve a user defined target concentration. You don't work with in the dose domain, you work in the concentration domain. On startup, the user must select the drug on the pump and dial in, elect a specific pharmacokinetic model, input the patient characteristics, such as weight, age, gender, etc. Depending on the model you're using, you might need less or more covariates to, to dial in the pump, to enter in the pump for that specific patient in, on your operating table. The system implements the required infusion rates to reach and maintain that target concentration, as I showed you in the simulation. And the user can then tie trades to a clinical drug effect by increasing or decreasing that target concentration. That is target controlled infusion. So you need a model. It all starts with a good pharmacokinetic model describing the time course of the plasma concentration for the kinetics and for the dynamics, the relationship between the concentration and the clinical effect. But as we all know, it's only a vague representation, a representation of the human body because as we know, the human body is very complex and as quoted previously by Steve Schaefer in various editorials, all models are wrong, some are useful, and this is the original quote coming from a statistician, George Bucks, and he published a paper on that, proving it even mathematically, that some of the models, all they are wrong, but some are useful. So we needed some basic mathematics and basic models to describe, before we could even think about TCI to describe the mechanisms of um, drug transport and drug elimination. And although the very basic work was uh, published in 1999, this publication from Kruger Timer from the 50s was considered as the basic um, publication to describe in a differential equation to track the concentrations of the drug in each compartment. And here you see the very first representation of these differential equations to, to describe the time course and the transport between, in this case, a two compartmental model. Later on, these differential equations were, um, were extended for multi-compartmental models and even for a um, effect site model added as like a kind of a fourth compartment. And these differential equations describes um, the instantaneous rate of a transfer of drug at a specific time t. Unfortunately, when this um, came alive in the 80s, uh, as you all uh, probably are aware of, the computers were very slow and uh, solving that differential equation was very hard at that time. So some um, earlier method tra transformed that to, to some kind of um, solution for the difference equation that could be handled by the computer technology and the slow processors at that time was required. One of the methods to do that is a well-known model called the Euler method and then you go from differential equations to different equations describing the rate of drug transfer over a small slice of time. So can, you can work in units and the, the, the computers at that time needed that time to just do the calculations. We can't imagine that now with all our, even our smartphone as a processor that needed to, to be in a complete room uh, 30 years ago. So this was what's called the numerical approach um, and was the first approach to solve these differential equations. So we had an idea about the pharmacokinetic model to describe um, how drugs were behaving. You don't have an algorithm to steer TCI at that moment. And it was um, Professor Helmut Schwilden, unfortunately passed away, and a member of this society passed away, uh, passed away last year. Helmut Schwilden was the first to describe a general method in um, 91, it was published, a general method for calculating the dosage schemes in linear pharmacokinetics. So he, in fact, transformed the pharmacokinetic modeling information from the difference equation into a steering algorithm for TCI. 
in fact, offering the society, offering uh, medicine a real tool, the engine for steering, as the first steering these TCI pumps. And um, his, um, his longtime friend, Jürgen Schuttler, and at that time, uh, Professor Stuckel was in Bonn, the chairman of the department. They were the first to inject um, uh, a drug, it was a paper on etomidate, in a pharmacokinetic based infusion system. So this was the first paper that was published in 93 on the pharmacokinetics as applied to total intravenous anesthesia. And this is um, Professor Schuttler, a little bit younger, less gray at that time, uh, in 79, uh, standing in front of uh, his computer, and they built um, a second device that um, was named the Katia device in 91, and they did a lot of studies in the 80s with this device. It was one of the, in fact, it was the first prototype of a TCI pump. So they applied, uh, based on the, on the work from Helmut Schwilden, they applied what is called the BET scheme. So in fact, um, simplistically said, the algorithm will calculate a specific bolus dose to fill up the central compartment, rapid infusion in fact, but it's a bolus uh, to increase central compartment concentration to the target concentration, and then you have to continue with a combination of two infusions. You have to take care of the elimination, and that was before the work of Schwilden well known, but the problem is it's just a continuous infusion, but on top of that, you need to take into account the transfer of the drug between the several compartments. And that was not very well described in the literature and not very well known before. So the combination of that bolus to reach a specific concentration at the plasma level and following by a um, sum of an elimination and transfer infusion resulting in a slowly decreasing infusion over time, this was what is in the literature known as the BET scheme. Unfortunately, that scheme could only be used for plasma targets, TCI, we didn't know anything at that time about a target controlled infusion of the effect site, although there were some publications on that, but it was not implemented in the uh, mid 80s. And another drawback was that you had to start from scratch. No previous drug could be administered, otherwise the system didn't work. So it was the very first rudimental approach to TCI, but we needed more and flexible algorithms and technology and mathematics. And in fact, we have to acknowledge, um, and Steve is here in the room in the back, Steve Schaefer and his group, and Jim Jacobs and his group were the, the two first to uh, publish a closed form mathematical solution for target controlled infusion. That was a, did a better job already than the BAT scheme and the very rudimental description how things should work. So this closed form mathematical solution precisely tracked the drug concentration, but the infusion rate was still an approximate solution, but good enough for the computers at that time to handle um, the um, infusion rate, having enough processor time that, that was required. Then the, a little bit later, um, Jim Jacobs published the first exact correct solution of the difference equation algorithm, but we had to wait until 92 um, after an intermediate step in 91 uh, from Jim, uh, Jim Bailey and Steve Schaefer's article. In fact, in 92, Steve published the exact solution algorithm extended for even the effect site. And this is in fact the paper, this paper describes, this manuscript describes the two basic algorithms for calculation of the infusion rates necessary for a computer controlled infusion pump to rapidly achieve, as I told you, and maintain the desired concentration, not only at the plasma site, but also at the effect site. In the appendix, you find all the required information for building your own TCI pump and the only TCI algorithm. You find two solutions for the differential equation, the numerical solution and the better solution, the analytical solution, and in fact, this is now the solution that is used as the basic algorithm for all common TCI pumps you are finding in the, uh, in, in the different uh, commercial brands. Of course, Steve was um, inspired at that time by the work from um, Lou Shiner um, at UCSF, 
And um, Professor Shiner with this pharmacology group was the first to describe a model that linked the pharmacokinetics with the pharmacodynamics called the linking model, creating here that concept of the effect side compartment in between. So you, you had a group or several groups that were working on the algorithm solution, and of course you had a group at UCSF working on the fundamental modeling issues. And they all came very nicely together. So in fact, at that moment, 92, um, 1990, we had all the components required to start building prototypes. The world was accepting these publications and various academic groups in the 90s um, <laughs> and even earlier started to build prototypes. I already talked to you about the, the group from Schwilden, Schuttler and Stuckel, the Katia device. We have to acknowledge the huge works of Max Awesomes from Leiden, um, who also was connected with uh, people from the US, and he built an old system called TIAC. Of course, we have to acknowledge the work from Elvis Jacobs and Reeves and uh, Peter Glass, first in Alabama, then at Duke University, Khaki 1 and Khaki 2. I will show you some pictures later on. In the meantime, in the UK, Tackley um, published two papers on uh, using his own system. In Brussels, a university, Luc Barvey started in uh, 1989 to work on a quite complex system with multiple pump infusion possibilities, published 15 papers on this. Um, in the meantime, and I will come back on that, in Glasgow, Professor Kenny uh, and Dr. White started uh, to work on their diprofuser prototypes. That one what will become or became the first commercial uh, TCI device later on. Of course, you have much more papers. The champion is still um, Professor Schaefer. Steve, you have uh, 268 publications where a stand pump has been used. Our search starts in, stopped in 2014. Uh, and by the way, this is all published in a series of, um, of reviews published in the January issue uh, this year in, in anesthesia and analgesia for those who want to read more of the details. Um, Max Awesomes, one of the real pioneers here, had a very basic system, and um, Jim Bovel's name was al already mentioned, and Jim wanted to, to, to have a new system for opiate testing, because these systems were used to test the pharmacology of drugs. A young guy at that time, Frank Engbers, joined the department, and Frank built his own uh, system uh, in France, we had uh, Xavier Vivian from Marseille, who built the PAMO system. Um, Tom Desmet, who is here present in the room, and myself were fortunate with, uh, initially with a lot of help from, from the Stanford group to build Rugloop. I will show you a picture on that, and uh, it's also quite well uh, used. Uh, we, we found 93 hits using uh, the system. In um, South Africa, um, uh, Johan Kutze, also one of the uh, long-standing members of this society and, and a uh, lifetime awardment uh, winner built stand pump. In Bonn, you have a new system from, uh, from Professor Hüft. Uh, in Chile, you have an effuser and Antiasan University. This was the last one where we could find some publications on. They have their own system. So the age of the prototypes, worldwide, people started to use TCI systems to prove that TCI is a um, valid technology to inject, to administer intravenous anesthetics, and to, um, to study the pharmacokinetics of intravenous anesthesia. Just um, for fun, some pictures, Katia, the Kaki device, the Stanpum device, with a brand new computer at that time. Um, the the Stalpum device from uh, Johan Kutze was a software package. Uh, the system from Frank Engbers with a PSYR organizer at that time. By the way, two of these systems are still used in the cardiac department at Leiden University and, and Sasha Meyer here in her room, now working in Groningen and worked in Leiden. Sasha, they are still using it, is it? And it works perfect. So you see, it's not because it's a PSYR organizer, it doesn't work well. Luc Barvis system, being able to do a lot of things, also closed loop. Um, uh, the uh, Chilean system on top. This is our system uh, that was built in Ghent University and is also used now in Groningen in our institution. Tom Desmet created the Rugloop system, also able to collect data. 
and also the engine for closed loop. And this is the, the actual system from uh, the Erlangen group, and now it's called Ivy Feet, originated the Katia system. In the meantime, in Glasgow, one of the prototypes came from um, Professor Kenny's group. He started also on a big computer in 1988. In ni uh, one year later, he also found out that these psion organizers connected to an Omida pump, a valley, valley, very popular pump at that time. We also used it in Ghent. Um, that this is an ideal combination to steer very rudimental, very rudimentally TCI algorithms. He professionalized this, and in 1990, Professor Kenny's group in Glasgow came up with a more professionalized prototype, already with a back bar and, and a, a, a microprocessor inside with some knobs. And this is, in fact, the final prototype that became, later on, the Profuser. We have to acknowledge this man, Dr. Ian Glenn, also a long-lasting member of this society, Ian Glenn is not only the father of Propofol, but also the father of the commercialization of the Profuser. At the World Conference in Den Haag in 92, he called a group of experts to debate about, isn't it the right time to start commercializing TCI? So all these experts who made all these prototypes were sitting in a room, and at that time it was still ICI, they selected the Glasgow system with the back bar as the one that that had the best chances at that time to become a commercial product. AstraZeneca didn't want to do, to do the job on their own, so their strategy was to build a piece of hardware with two microprocessors inside, an 8-bit and a 16-bit, where the 8-bit processor was the one doing the numerical solution of the differential equation, and the 16-bit doing the analytical solution, just to double-check what was considered at that time being very important, and the Refuser was incorporated in the commercially available syringe pumps at that time. And also at that time, historically, they decided that the model published by Marsh and, and co-workers at Glasgow was at that time the best model to incorporate in that the Refuser pump. In 96, at the next World Conference, um, this, this system became alive and commercially available. The Refuser was um, incorporated into four commercially available pump systems, uh, one from um, Alaris at that time, one from Graceby, one from Fresenius, and one from Terimo. And the Terimo system, and I'm looking to talk to Masui here in the room, is still used in Japan, isn't it? It's still the only one that is allowed uh, by the Japanese authorities as a clinical useful uh, TCI system, and it has to, a lot to do with regulations, also with the insert truck label. There were some drawbacks, of course. Historically, it was a first generation of TCI pumps, only Propofol, and I have to say only AstraZeneca Diprevan at that time, because the drug was still patented, only one model, two concentrations possible, Propofol 1%, Propofol 2%, syringe recognition, a big thing. There was, with the glass syringe, it was a tacked syringe, and the, the tack here, which was a magnetic tack, slided into a slot, telling the pump on, hey guys, this is a glass syringe with 1% propofol, and this syringe, with this syringe, you are allowed to do diprofuser target-controlled TCI. That was a safety issue that was required by a lot of uh, notified bodies, and it worked perfect. Drawback, only blood targeting was possible. I told you about the dual processors, and the target concentration limits were also included in the pump. It's a historical system. It's the first system that, be, that, that used pharmacokinetic-driven computer-based technology and brought it into the market. Now, in the meantime, of course, people are, uh, in the room here, society members became very active in developing, learning more about the drug behavior and publishing new models. Thomas Schneider, present here in the room, published um, uh, as a fellow in, in Steve's group the, 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 the Schneider model. Uh, Tony Absalon in Glasgow published Pate Fuser, which is the pediatric model, and um, in Steve's laboratory, um, Kataria was working on a model for children. We have another model from Domino for ketamine. And on the opiates, we have to acknowledge the collaboration between Charles Minto and Thomas Schneider. By the way, Thomas, this picture is taken on the rooftop uh, in Venice in the First World Society uh, Conference. 
and I found it in my archive. And both guys worked on Remy Fentanyl, and of course Elizabeth Gaps in Brussels uh, worked on Sufentanyl. Steve himself worked on Fentanyl. There are, there are three or four other models available for Fentanyl, and you have a lot of models available for all Fentanyl. I selected one here for our book chapter in Miller's Anesthesia, um, the one that is also in one of the pumps commercially available, published by Metra and colleagues. Now more models, more flexibility for the models also means more complexity. At this time, we have like 12 pediatric published models for propofol. We have a bunch of models for, um, for adults. And so as Tony Absalon and, and, and some others of us published in, an, in a review article recently, or a couple of years ago, in, in the BGA, pharmacokinetics models for propofol alone, watch out guys, because there are differences. You have to know as a clinician which model you should use in which category of patients. So you have to know the details because there are some details that are resulting in difficulties, resulting in detailed changes in the infusion profile, which are significant. So more models, more complexity, that was the issue. In the meantime, we also learned in the pharmacology society that plasma TCI was not the best to do for a drug, for example, like propofol. And we published a paper and we proved that in fact, with good models, effect side control TCI did a better job, better predictability for falling asleep, less variability, in the population at the moment of loss of consciousness. So taking this all together, at this moment, we have around nine systems that are available worldwide. This is the actual situation. Um, these, these pumps, some of them, most all of them have propofol TCI, remifentanil, some of them have alfentanil, fentanyl, sufentanil, one has midazolam, a range of models, not only plasma, but also the capability of doing effect side controlled TCI. Uh, one drawback, one step back in time, no syringe recognition or no drug concentration recognition. Something for the engineers to think about to increase safety. So where are we now? I think it's interesting to say, and this was also the title of the review we published in ANA that we can say that it's a mature technology. We asked all these pump companies, the picture you saw, where are you selling your pumps? And the green parts are um, the countries where these drug companies are active. So these are the countries in the world where TCI is used actively. There is one country in the world where you don't have it, and this is how the picture is published in anesthesia and algesia. When I arrived here two days ago, I realized that this, at this moment, might be politically incorrect. So I changed it a little bit. Is it a mature technology? I think I can say yes. We did some numbers and some estimations we published also in this review article. We know from the companies, and I will not provide to any of you details because we received these data under confidentiality from the pump companies. We sent them an inquiry. We received some confidential sales information. But I can tell you that more than 60,000 pumps were sold before 2014. These are incomplete data because two of the six companies didn't want to provide their sales numbers, but I can tell you it's a representative amount of pumps. In my hospital, to give you an idea, we do 10,800 TCI administrations per year. Tony Absalon, first author of this paper, found out that in the detailed database of the NAP5, the National Inquiry in the UK, anesthesiologists working in the UK reported that in the UK, TCI is used in a 